that uh, the question is, can we trust God when uh, we seem to be going through very difficult circumstances? Do we truly know that um, he wants what's best for us? It's hard to admit that. It's easy when it's the, the feasting times, isn't it? It's hard when it's the famine seasons. Amen. Good to see you guys. Good morning. You guys made it. You're blessed. You made it to 130 degrees of, of, of heat out there. Did we hit 130 yet? I, I heard that's where we're, where we're at soon. So welcome to the AC. Praise God for air conditioning. Amen. Good to see you guys. Uh, take out your Bibles. Turn to Zechariah chapter 9. We'll be there in a few moments. But before we get there, I want to just um, uh, invite you to come out tonight. We're going to have an informal, casual dialogue about God. I know, big topic. We got about an hour and a half. We'll uh, we'll address whatever questions you might have, and that's really what it is. It's a conversation, and you come and and uh, just you know throw out um, a thought, a concern, a question, something that maybe you've been wrestling with. So very informal tonight. We'll talk about God's nature, His attributes, the Trinity, things like that. So right here at six o'clock, and uh, Cornelius, our resident uh, <laughs> Roman. Um, also known as Kurt, so um, uh, his study is going to be fantastic. So they're going to be dealing with topics of cosmology and evolution, and that's going to run for the next three Wednesday nights. So appreciate you doing that, Kurt. So if you have more questions, Kurt, raise your hand just so people can. Th- that, there's the location right there of Kurt, also known as Cornelius. So um, uh, good to have you guys here. I like I kid because I love Ryan. So good to see you. Um, just give you guys a quick update. Uh, we are currently uh, training up about six men and women for future possible leadership roles here in the church. And we just started that this past week. So uh, meeting with four men and three women that would potentially become deacons in the church. And so uh, we meet every other uh, Monday night. And I just want to encourage you guys to pray for that group. It's it's fun. And I love the discussions that we're able to have. And Always look to see how God may raise up men and women to serve in, in a leadership role here at Missio Day, and uh, uh, just love this group, and I'm really excited about that. And part of that group is a, is a young man by the name of Jorgen Gregg. Uh, Jorgen, uh, you may know him from playing piano this morning or playing drums in the past weeks, but I'm going to have Jorgen come on up. Where's Jorgen at? Jorgen, come on up right there, front and center. Give him a hand if you would. So. So Jorgen is a student at Grand Canyon University and uh, studying worship arts. Yeah. Dude, I nailed it. Yeah, all right, we're done. Go sit down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Jorgen um, has been a part of the Missio community for a couple years now and just has a heart to serve in ministry and feels like God's calling him to serve in ministry. And so the past uh, couple months, we've been batting around the idea of him coming on just as far as a like a pastoral intern with some specific areas of focus and uh, leadership just thought that was a great idea. So we've got Jacob uh, leading music. We've got Ryan serving in uh, a very variety of capacities. Jorgen's going to come on and not only assist Jacob with music, but Jorgen is going to also help spearhead a youth ministry for middle school, high school kids here at Missio Day. So I'm really super excited about that. Um, so... Oh, he'll get his experience in that role, right? <laughs> so uh, he's going to do a fantastic job, and uh, I'm really excited about what God's going to teach him and, and how we're going to work together. I meet with each of these uh, young men weekly for accountability, for a time of just uh, deepening our walk with the Lord, and uh, there's, a, there's always an eye towards being the best ministers in God's work as possible. So I'm really super excited about his openness, his availability. And so just be praying for, for Jorgen and be praying for, for us as a church to best know how to uh, lead him and to shape him and to just see what God would potentially have for him. And so uh, with that said, next Sunday night, he's going to start the first of who knows how many uh, meetings with middle school, high school kids, and that's going to take place here at Sozo. So 6.30, uh, probably food, games, time in the Word. And uh, one of the things we've been talking about is just how do we disciple young people? That's the aim, you know. I, I don't want to just provide a kind of a Jesus rah-rah time, right, where the kids don't go deep. Kids want to go deep. And kids want to be discipled. And so I'm excited how God's going to use Jorgen in their lives. So if you have a young 
adult in your household or you know of somebody between the ages of 12 and 18, let them know about this. So for the next few months, we're going to just do a once a month thing here at Sozo. And then after these few months, we may go to every other week. week we're not sure. But uh, it's going to be a great time. So get to know Jorgen. I, get, I gave him your di- his, his digits to you. They're in the insert there. So um, don't be texting him saying, hey, I love how you play piano. I mean, that's good stuff too. But just pray and say, I'm really praying for you, Jorgen. And uh, don't assume we have info on your student uh, either. Use your communication card. Make sure we have the right name, the right number, so that we can keep these young people in the mix. And uh, I don't know about you. I was deeply impacted as a uh, as a high school kid when god saved me 1985 and i know some of you go like that he can't be that old yeah i know i look good for my age don't i so um i was impacted i know my wife was impacted with uh, in our youth groups and uh so we're just trying to do something to help disciple these young people so jorgen's gonna be at the helm doing that and i'm just really super jazzed about that so anything you want to share with the church to put you on the spot on the spot, so. Super blessed because, um, you know, going in my journey to looking for teachers and ministers and things like that, to start kind of starting those, um, yeah, it's just a God thing, you know, you can feel it in the air, and I'm really excited for the journey to begin with, because it's so simple, but it's just a place where you can be, it's a place where you get impacted the most. Yeah. I plan on doing my best job. So, cool. My best. That's good. We know you will, buddy. You know you will. You can also find Jorgen here uh, slinging shots of espresso behind the bar. So he's one of our baristas. So uh, pray for Jorgen. We're going to pray for him now. Um, and just appreciate your, your prayer and your support. And uh, let's pray for him. Father, thank you for this guy. I, lo- I love him. I appreciate him. Lord, uh, guide and direct his steps, Lord. I know he's going to do a fantastic job because his heart is he wants to glorify you. He wants to serve you. And I pray that uh, you would just give him just such an incredible experience of serving in your church. Lord, seeing young men, young women come to know Jesus and grow in that walk with him. Uh, Use him in just such a spectacular way, Lord, where you get the glory and he gets the, the benefit of knowing the joy of serving a great God and king like yourself. And so thank you for his life. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're preparing for him. Lord, I know that uh, there's just a, a great future for, for Jorgen, and I'm excited that he, he gets to kind of cut his teeth in this context. So bless him, bless his work, Lord, and uh, we're just going to be excited and rejoice in advance of what you're going to do. And we just commit him and the ministry into your care, and just thank you for all things in Christ. Amen. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. I'll give you a hug. I'll give you a hug. So get to know Jorgen. He's great. So uh, turn to Zechariah chapter 9. We're going to be in Zechariah 9, 10, and uh, 11 this morning. Now that the band's gone to all these iPads on their, there's no music stands up here uh, anymore. So there's one hiding back here. So I'm going to grab this. And uh, so I've been listening to the radio this week. And uh, it seems like all the commercials about Father's Day are about three things. Barbecues, Lazy Boys, and cable television. Is that, is that where we've arrived for fatherhood in our, in our, in our country? Lazy boys, father, uh, is, is, you know, cable and barbecue. Is that all we do is, as fathers is sit around and watch cable and demand for, for, for good, juicy pork ribs to be delivered to us? That's what I told my kids. That's what I want to do. Sit on my lazy boy, watch cable, and just have barbecue delivered to me. So is that too much to ask? I'm, I think about my dad. My dad just moved back to Phoenix from Las Vegas. It's good to have him back in town. I invited him out this morning, but he couldn't make it. But if you know my dad, uh, he is such a wonderful, wonderful father, especially uh, considering what my family has been through, uh, losing my mom to cancer at a very young age, and him being a dad of three kids, just trying to make it and hold things together. Uh, my dad has taught me a lot in life, and I remember uh, we were from the Bay Area, California, in San Jose. We used to go out and play Frisbee at this college all the time. He loved Frisbee, and uh, I just remember his, his joyful, free spirit of just taking the kids out and just throwing the Frisbee and him acting like a big five-year-old kid himself out there just wrestling with us. And, and as we got older, one thing my dad and I shared is a love for music. And uh, my dad will randomly call me up 
and just say, hey, I'm listening to this new song on the radio by, so- have you heard it? And we just talk about music, and my, dad, my wife's like, why did your dad call? Oh, he just wanted to talk about this band. He just wanted to talk about this song, and, and I remember 12 years of age. Here's how, here's how amazing my dad is. Dad, I want to go to an ACDC concert. Well, let's go. 12 years of age, this is, this is my dad taking me to ACDC. It was the, uh, for those about to rock tour. And then we did it again the next year for the Flick of the Switch tour. And then we did it again. We've gone to so many <laughs> concerts together. And the great thing is my dad, he'll be out there. He'll be rocking with everybody else. And that, that's why we call him Rock and Ron. So if you ever meet my dad, go ahead and call him Rock and Ron. And he'll just totally love that, that, that label. Um, and then just through some of the difficult journeys, see, my dad just, uh, just trust in God. My dad came to know the Lord around the same time my mom did. But uh, shortly after they believed in Jesus, you know, my mom uh, lost this bad little cancer. And watching my dad wrestle with faith, it was, an, it was an honest wrestling. It was an honest battle. And my dad continued just to love us kids and, and do his best to, to hold things together. And um, you know what? My dad, however imperfect he, he was and is, he has left me a good model. He's left me a good portrait of what it means to be a dad. And uh, it's haunting to see... Uh, my kids say, Dad, what you just did is just like Grandpa, what he does. You know, sometimes it's weird how we manifest the influence in our lives, men uh, uh, from their dads and women from their moms. But I love my dad, and someday you'll, uh, you'll meet him. And, and I know some of you don't have that portrait of a father. Some of you have never experienced that. When, I think, when, I think, when you think of dad or think of father, often negative imagery imagery comes to mind negative memories come to mind and i want you to know this morning that you know god heals in that work you know one of the things i used to do when i ministered to college students is you know when we talked about father there were some kids that had a horrible upbringing and the anytime you mention heavenly father or mention father in the context of god there is negative associations with god and i want you to know that that's okay but I want you to know that God can heal in those experiences. He can, he can take the, those negative experiences and turn them into something fruitful and wonderful and positive. And God is always trying to invade our world and show us accurate pictures of himself. Would you agree with that? That God is trying to correct what we do imperfectly? That God's trying to, to break through and to say to you that he's a, he's a much better father than any of our earthly fathers could be? And... Uh, uh, and, and how much this is true for our passage this morning. This morning we're going to look at two things about God and his, his character that I believe are going to be healing for us, that are going to perhaps deliver us from some past baggage, from, from past bondage. I believe the truths we'll look at today are really designed by God to set us free, to see perhaps a, a more accurate picture of God than we've ever considered before. So in Zechariah chapter 9, 10, 11, we're going to notice two pictures of God. And what I mean by this is we're going to look at the Son, Jesus, because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you hear Jesus, you've heard the Father. And so we're going to look at Jesus as we have been these past few weeks and as we're going to do next week. Zechariah gives us beautiful portraits of God. Today we're going to look at two of them. The first one being Jesus is the kingly one, and second is Jesus is the shepherding one. So the first point we're going to consider this morning is Jesus is the kingly one. The second one being Jesus is the shepherding one. What's amazing about this passage this morning is this. We are going to look at some pretty amazing truths that we will call prophecy about the coming Messiah. The Old Testament, 39 books in your Bible, all point to the future God has for his people. There's so much in the Old Testament that points to the coming Messiah, the coming Savior. And if we think of the Old Testament as forward-looking, you can find and trace Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And perhaps these passages we're looking at today really point this out more than any other section of the Old Testament. So Zechariah 9, 10, 11, rich passages concerning the coming Messiah. As a matter of fact, we're going to see six prophecies that were fulfilled 
in Jesus' ministry. Now, this is what I believe sets the Bible apart from any other book of antiquity. This sets the Bible apart from just being a mere book. I believe the Bible is truly God's living and active word given to us so that we can understand who He is and how we're to live in light of who He is. And so when we come across passages like we're going to come across today, it really really validates the truthfulness of what the Bible claims to be. Because there are numerous prophecies about the coming Jesus. There are 300, over 300 prophecies about the coming Jesus. Now, I want you to know, we're going to look at six of them this morning, but statistically, if any person even fulfilled eight of the prophecies found in the Old Testament, do you know what the odds are of that? Let's get statistical. Some of you like statistics. I can't stand it, but I'm just showing you this to reveal to you how how smart I am, perhaps. I don't know. But if any eight of these hundreds of prophecies, if one man fulfilled any eight, it would be like one in one trillion odds. Now some of you are like, That's, that, my brain's bleeding right now. Thanks a lot. It's hot outside, now my brain hurts. Here's what it would equate to. Imagine taking the state of Texas, filling it two feet deep with silver dollars, Marking one of those silver dollars with an X on it, dropping a man blindfolded from a plane into that pit of silver dollars, and him having one chance to pick that one silver dollar with the X on it, that's one in a trillion chances. Yet Jesus not only fulfilled eight, but he he fulfilled hundreds of these prophecies, which is staggering. Which tells me what God says in his word is true. Which tells me what Jesus accomplished in his ministry can be validated. And you have all this stuff that even researchers and historians and scientists today scratch their heads. And they sit there and we go, we don't know how they did it. How God did it. Well, that's the point is sometimes God does things that are beyond our comprehension. Amen. And so we come to the scripture like we do today. And we see this this account of these prophecies being fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. And a lot of those prophecies were beyond human control. Because it would be easy to say, well, there's things that you can set up to fulfill prophecy that you can do as far as your actions. But there's things that Jesus did, like the manner in which he was born, where he was born, the betrayal, the things like that. Those are things beyond his control. So what we have before us is an amazing section of Scripture. So turn to Zechariah chapter 9, and the first place we're going to start in considering this person, Jesus, is consider how he is a king, and a king like you wouldn't believe. And, and, and when I mention Jesus as king, he, he is sovereign over all. Colossians says everything in the world was created by him and through him and for him. And now we exist in this creation that he is superintending. He is in control over. And as king, he wants to not only rule over creation, he wants to rule over our lives. And so this morning, as we consider this first point, I want you to consider his rulership in your life. Now, when we think of kings, sometimes we think of earthly kings. We think of kings that are evil, and we think of kings that are selfish, and we think of kings that don't treat their subjects well. And, and I want you to know that, that Jesus as king is unlike any earthly king we can imagine. As a matter of fact, Napoleon, you guys familiar with Napoleon Bonaparte? He said this, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, myself, founded empires. But Napoleon said this, Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, he says, millions of men would die for him. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? That here is this King Jesus who could have demanded allegiance. He could have run roughshod over people's lives and exercised such a supreme power and authority. But yet he came to build this empire of love. Reminds me of this. This interview I heard on the radio the other day on NPR. Yes, I love Jesus and listen to NPR. You're welcome. So the interviewer was talking to Richard Dawkins, who is one of the world's most prominent atheists, 
I've read Dawkins' work. I've heard Dawkins' lecture. I don't arrive at the same conclusions Dawkins arrives at. He is, his worldview is, is atheism. And his big thing is to go forth and speak around the world about how religious extremism is the, 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 the biggest thing when it comes to terrorism in our world. And if we get rid of religion, we get rid of terrorism. Now what Dawkins doesn't understand or fails to see is that most people died in the 20th century under the hands of atheistic regimes than anything religion-based. More people died at the hands of Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot than they did under any sort of extreme, uh, you know, religious extremism. But what I loved about the interview was this. The, the interviewer from NPR pressed Dawkins and said, now I understand you subscribe to an atheistic worldview, but here's one thing I want to press you on, Dr. Dawkins. How come when tragedy strikes, all you see in this world are men and women of faith rising up to lend support, to lend assistance, and help people going through difficult times. I don't see atheistic charities out there going into helping people where they're at. And you can tell Dawkins didn't like the question, right? Yeah, you're saying, Dr. Dawkins, that religion is responsible for so much violence and terrorism, which I would say there is a a splinter of that. But what the interviewer said to Dr. Dawkins, but you'd have to recognize, Dawkins, that there are so many people of faith, so many men and women who love God that are out there on the front lines doing a great work in trying to help people out. And Dawkins said, I would acknowledge that. And he said, Dr. Dawkins, do you, do you have any groups like that going out and helping people? He says, I do have a group. It's called Secular Rescue. And the interviewer's like, tell me about that. Well, we go into places where if you're, not, if you're persecuted for how you think, your intellectual conclusions will go in and help them in those situations. And the interviewer said, so what you're saying is you will only help when you are being challenged and being intellectually correct. And what I love, I'm listening to NPR and going, this is good. This is good because I've also pressed this point that if you try to live life apart from God, if you try to live within a worldview that does not consider God to be an important part of your life, guess what? You're living for yourself and no one else receives compassion or mercy or grace from you because all you can think about is your, is your own worldview. And it hurts other people. And now we have a king named Jesus who comes on the scene and he is going to build his empire on not being served but giving his life as service so that you can know God's love through him. That's awesome. So we come to Zechariah 9. You guys there yet? See, I give you this long intro to give you guys time to, time to find it. Zechariah chapter 9. Notice how this king shows up, and I want you to focus specifically on two verses, verses 9 and 10. So verses 1 through 8 gives us this buildup. Historically, God is going to protect his people from someone who's going to rise up and start basically attacking the whole region. And in verse 9, we come in and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Those titles referring to God's people generally. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Now stop right there. God's supreme end in being king and showing you his kingship is so that you would know joy. Notice how the verse starts, rejoice. God wants you to rejoice in Him. He wants you to rejoice in your life. He wants you to rejoice in your world. He wants joy to be the aim of your life. This is what I love about God is that He's not a cosmic killjoy who does what He does to sabotage joy from you. He wants to give joy to you. And He says, so people of God rejoice. Your King is coming. For he is just and endowed with salvation. We'll talk about that. Then we'll look at verse 10. He's coming and he's humble. And he's mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, 
the foal of a donkey. Circle those two verses. Highlight those two verses. These are important verses to unpack. And I want to do them briefly, and I want to show you four truths out of these these two verses that are going to help us this morning. Number one, we have a king who is righteous. We have a king who delivers. We have a king who is humble. And we have a king who triumphs. The first point, the king who is righteous. God is because he is righteous, always does what is just. This is encouraging to us as we live in a world where there's lots of injustice. We live in a world where someone is guilty because of text messages that led to someone killing themselves, and then someone is set free who should have been guilty for shooting a young black man in a state in our country. We sit there and go, how can these things be? And we cry, this is not right. And though these are fallible people, we have fallible judges and fallible juries, and some would call the system broken and corrupt, there is a king who is righteous and will make right every wrong, will vindicate every situation, and he will stand for his people. See, this is good for us to hear because when we are surrounded by so much that seems unjust, we have a king who is righteous. Consider the first three verse, uh, first eight verses of, of chapter 9. I'm not going to go into it, but you need to know a little bit of history. There's a guy named Alexander the Great. You guys familiar with Alexander the Great? Some of you are. Some of you are history nerds like me. So verses 1 through 8 talk about this co- conqueror who's going to come through. And Alexander the Great, 200 years after this was written, comes through and starts destroying all these cities in the Middle East. He comes through and he's basically this says he's going to take over Tyre and Sidon and all these Philistine villages and he's just going to lay waste all these places. As a matter of fact, Tyre, if you look at verse four, 3, Tyre built herself a fortress, piled up silver like dust, and gold like the mire on the streets. Now stop right there. You know what's amazing about that prophecy is that 200 years later, Alexander went to this town called Tyre, which is in modern-day Lebanon. Tyre had two cities. There was one on the, on the, on the coast, and then there was an island city. And so when, when uh, Alexander came in, he conquered this city, but they were trying to figure out how to get to the city that was on this island, half mile off the coast. You know what Alexander did? He took all the rubble from the city he just destroyed, began to pile it in the ocean, and built a causeway to this other city and took it. And this is what it's like. It's saying, you are going to be destroyed, Tyre, and they're going to take all that stuff, and they're going to come out to you, and you're not going to have anything left. And that's exactly what happened in history. Another prophecy yet fulfilled in the Scriptures. But then you go down to verse 8. But I will camp around my house because of my army, because of him who passes by and returns, and no oppressor will pass over them anymore, for now I have seen with my own eyes. Here's what you need to understand. What Zechariah is saying is even though this person is going to come through and take all these cities, you, God's people, will be protected. And Josephus, one of the great historians of years ago, said this, Alexander came by and did not lay a finger on the people of God. Because the high priest at the time saw a vision and said, if you go out and decorate the city with wreaths and dress in white, Alexander will come through and he won't touch you. And that's exactly what history has proven. He did not touch the people of God. Because he saw their regalia, he saw their worship of God, and he himself even gave sacrifices to their God. But he did not touch them. And he continued on to Babylon where he was going to re-raise Babylon from nothing. And that's where he died at age 32. You know, Alexander thought himself so powerful, so righteous, that at one point he came and he fell down on his knees and he cried because there were no more uh, lands to conquer. But he was unrighteous in so many ways. And that's why Zechariah says there's a king coming who's not like Alexander. Amen? There's a king coming who's not like Charlemagne. There's a king coming who's not like any of the Caesars. This king is righteous. 
Not only that, He delivers. Consider this. Jesus comes into the world, does this incredible ministry in the lives of people, not what the religious people were expecting. His ministry was a ministry built on an empire of love. But He comes in, and His goal is to extend grace and deliver people from their sins. Think about the ministry of Jesus. Helping the lepers, healing the blind, ministering to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, showing them a different way. And he's a God who, belie- who delivers. And, and you need to know something. I want you to write this down in your notes, please, because this is so key. He doesn't deliver because you pay attention to his teaching. He doesn't deliver because you're watching every action, every act of ministry he, he does. Salvation in Christ doesn't come because you agree with him on certain points he doesn't say you're saved by following me here's what you need to understand i want you to write this down he himself is salvation he doesn't offer a way he doesn't point to ethics and morals and virtues and things like that he says this i am salvation And so now he imparts the importance of relationship. He's not going to give you good teachings. He's not going to try to change your behavior as if your behavior modification is going to get you to heaven. He says he himself is salvation. Remember the words from 1 John chapter 5. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Here's the question. If Jesus is the delivering one, if he's a good king where he saves his people, do you have him? Do you believe in him? Or are you just trying to follow teachings? Are you just trying to embrace ethics? Because Jesus did not point to those things primarily. He said salvation starts with him. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever believes in me shall have eternal life. This is the key. This is a good king who not only comes to show how righteous he is, but he comes to deliver, but he delivers in a way that leads us to our third point. The king's humble. Because you can't get away from verse 10 and not think about what Jesus did in his earthly ministry a week before he would be crucified. He enters Jerusalem by what means? On a donkey. Now you need to understand something about the difference between donkeys and horses in this culture. Horses communicated status. Horses communicated wealth. Horses communicated power. Could Jesus have ridden in on a horse? Yes. But instead he says, hey, guys, go out and find a donkey I can borrow because I'm going to ride in on that. Now you talk about, you know, this anticlimactic event, right? Here he comes, little, little pony, walking right, right, right into Jerusalem. But what was he communicating? He didn't come as a warrior. He didn't come as a fighter. He came... As a peacemaker, because in this culture, a king rode on a donkey because not it was wartime because he was a peacemaker. The war's been done, it's been settled. He now offers peace. So he rides in on a donkey, and what's being communicated? He himself is salvation, and he has come on a mission now to bring peace. Awesome. See, all the other religious leaders were expecting. Someone to deliver them militarily. Someone to defeat the Roman Empire. This is not Jesus because his empire is not founded on violence and fighting. It is not founded on conflict. It is founded on him and the foundation of this is going to be love. Stop and consider that if you would. Because I I think what's true for Jesus is true of the church today. Can Can I bag on the church real quick please? Thank you. We do a horrible job of modeling peace, compassion, grace, and kindness to a world that wants to enter into a fight. 
And we need to realize that this war, number one, the battle belongs to, to the Lord, number one. Battle belongs to the Lord. Number two, the weapons of our warfare are not like the weapons of this world. You know what the only offensive weapon given to the church is today and forever, according to Ephesians chapter 6? The Word of God. Because the Word of God is what? It is a sword. And what you need to understand is truth, God's truth, objective truth, is the only weapon God has given to the church to fight the battles. We go out there and we start all sorts of skirmishes, and I sit there and go, oh no, please Lord, not the church. We're fighting battles we shouldn't be involved in. We're not fighting battles we should be involved in. And in the end, we're fighting sometimes with the wrong weapons. Go forth with the spirit of Christ, humility, use truth, couch that truth in grace, and see what God will do because ultimately the battle belongs to him. Amen, church? We need to do a better job of emulating Jesus. Just like Frederick Nietzsche said, who was an antagonist to Christianity, I'll believe in your redeemer when you guys start living more redeemed. The reason people don't believe in Jesus is because they're having a hard time seeing the spirit of Jesus in Jesus' people. And his humility, here he is, the son of God. Here's what's amazing, he borrows a donkey. I'm going to do a lecture sometime on how Jesus borrowed everything for his ministry. Here he is, God himself, he needs to borrow a coin for a a, a, a lesson. He needs to borrow food from a young boy to feed 5,000 people. He borrows a donkey. He's even thirsty, and here's the God who holds the H2O together and has to ask the Samaritan woman for a drink. He's got no place to lay his head. And here's the Son of God, deity himself, subjecting himself to his creation. Oh yeah, he could have called down a legion of angels to deliver him. He could have fought like nobody's business. But yet he humbled himself to the point of being a servant and dying a death he didn't deserve, Philippians chapter 2, for us. But yet, the one who humbled himself the most is the one who is now exalted to the highest place. He is worthy of our praise. He's righteous. He's a deliverer. He's humble. But what you need to understand now is that he triumphs. Because what Jesus took, the route he took in humility, he now triumphs in the end. And my God, now your God reigns. He reigns now. He has reigned forever in the past. He's going to reign forever in the future. And this is the promise that is now filled out for the rest of chapter 9. You can read about all the wonderful things this God has done for his people. Zechariah chapter 9 verses 11 through 17. He reigns and he's going to do whatever he can to reign in the hearts of his people and show you repeatedly that he's a God who is large and in charge. Is he reigning in your life? Have you you submitted yourself to his leadership? Because you won't know him as this good king if you haven't surrendered your kingdom. There is no place in history where kingdoms have coexisted and it was a good situation. A kingdom reigns and usurps all the others into that kingdom and it proves its rulership and its authority over these things. Jesus does not want you to be king as well. He wants you to be subject to his leadership. So the question at the end of the day is, what does his kingship look like in your life? Have you humbled yourself and received him as king? Do you know his goodness? Do you know his kindness? He's a king like none other. He's a king that wants what's best for his people. 32 years I've been walking with him, and I know this to be true more today than I did at the beginning. And it grows richer in time. Or yet, are you trying to find these things in the world because the world's going to try to promise you everything, but it never delivers? Have you been the victim of trying to to get something from the world thinking that was going to be something that was going to just make your life so much better and it just led to just emptiness? Have you been there? Have you experienced that? There's There's a mall in Moscow right now there's, it's got like a little ATM. You go in and you give them personal information. And for a dollar, for a dollar, you can get a hundred likes on your Instagram pictures. For $850, they'll give you 150,000 followers on your Instagram account. 
Now, number one, I'm not going to give personal information to the Russians. I pray for Russia. I'm going to let you know that this is probably a safe environment this morning. The Russians are not interfering with any activity going on here this morning. This is a Russia-free zone, I believe. But they're catering to something and obviously making money because people are looking for something. Oh, if I only get uh, 100 likes and it's going to cost me a buck, I might as well do it. Wait, 150,000 followers for $850? I mean, these people are desperate. And so are we. And don't point at the Russians and be like, oh, those silly Russians trying to get Instagram followers, blah, 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 blah. What, what are you searching after that you know in the end is not going to satisfy you? Because you may hit 150,000 followers, but is that, is that the arrival point? Is that the point where you just go, I've made it? Or does it create within you an insatiable thirst and hunger for more? And I'm going to tell you something. The world promises you so much, but it's empty promises, and you're going to end up hungrier and more desperate than you, than you ever imagined. And yet there's a God who serves as king, and he says, let my kingdom invade your world. Invite me to be that Lord on the throne of your heart, and let me prove to you my goodness and my love. Have you received this? Have you believed in this? He is Lord. Some of you have acknowledged that. Some of you haven't yet. And here's the, here's the bitter end for those of you that haven't. One day every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that He is Lord. So the question is, will you do it now voluntarily or will you be forced to do it one day against your will? Because as king, he can ultimately demand allegiance. And demanded allegiance is not joyful allegiance. That's good right there. Instagram that one out. See how many likes you get. He's good. And to show you how good he is, we shift into now perhaps one of the most beautiful motifs in all of scripture regarding this king who is also a shepherd. Jesus is the shepherding one. We don't know too much about shepherding in our culture. We don't know about sheep herding in, in our context. Phoenix isn't necessarily the sheep herding capital of the world. Um, I mean, we'd, be, we'd all be having lamb and, and stuff out there today if that was the case because it's 140 degrees right now in case you haven't checked your weather. But Jesus is the shepherding one. Think about this. And I want you to consider two points this morning under this point. Number one is that he's a faithful shepherd. And then number two, but he's also a rejected shepherd. See, it was a tough job to be a shepherd. In the Bible, Abel was a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. I mean, this was a popular vocation. And yet God chooses the picture of shepherd and sheep as perhaps one of the most poignant pictures of his relationship with us. Shepherding was not a glorious job. As a matter of fact, it wasn't glorious because sheep are typically pretty dumb animals. Yes, God is saying to you, you're not the brightest creature out there. And yet, shepherding was this picture that God chose to show how difficult it is to to lead his people. A shepherd would go out and lead these sheep, and oftentimes they were were nomadic, and they didn't necessarily have walled-in areas where they lived. They went from pasture to pasture, and oftentimes the shepherd would count, and he'd always be missing one, going, where did Randy go? Where is Debbie? Where are they wandering now? And he'd go off into some craggy ravine, and there's a sheep upside down, can't get out of the pit, and the shepherd usually carried two staffs with him. He had one that was to protect the sheep from any sort of wild animal that tried to get in and eat the sheep for dinner or anyone that was going to try to rob the sheep. So he had a a rod that protected and then he had a second rod that delivered in those craggy ravines where there's a sheep upside down who can't get right side up, would go down and fish that sheep out of this pit. So the shepherd would walk with two staffs leading the sheep into pastures to eat, to rest. 
And yet the sheep did all sorts of random, dumb activity. Now, what is the picture of a faithful shepherd? I'm going to tell you three things that the Bible always talks about concerning a faithful shepherd. And you can read about this in, in chapter 10, and we're not going to sp- pour it out in detail this morning, but I at least want to make you aware of it. And, I'm, and I want you to know why this is an important point. Because where and how you wind up in life depends on whom you follow. Right? A shepherd leads. The sheep are supposed to follow the shepherd. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. I've come for my sheep. I want to lead you. Now the question is, are you following him? Because where and how you end up someplace depends on whom you follow. And if you're not where God wants you to be, you're not following the right shepherd. You see the correlation? I remember camping up on the Mogollon Rim years ago, and uh, we were on trail, uh, the, the dirt trail 300, Forest Road 300, and, and you can get lost out there. This was before the day of smartphones, right? So we were really dumb back then, right? Because we didn't have these devices to help us. And I'm like, Lee, I'm going to follow. Everyone lead me. And I had this caravan of probably five cars. It was a big, big ministry type thing. All of a sudden, we're driving down Fire Road 300, and I just realized I don't know where I'm going. And my wife's getting mad at me, right? And then all of a sudden, the people are starting to get irritated at me, right? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure. And then I finally had to admit, I think we went the wrong way. And I was like, and I think we went like 20 miles on these dirt roads the wrong direction. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, it's frustrating being lost. It's frustrating ending up at a destination you never wanted to be at to begin with. But yet these people were following me, but I didn't know where I was going. How many people today are following people that don't know where they're going? I wonder how people do it. I, I, you see the infomercials, you read the advertisements, you sit there and go, you've got to be crazy to follow this person. And yet this is what makes cults so fascinating. Ask my wife, I love watching documentaries on why people follow these really crazy people. And yet they wonder why they end up in abusive, manipulative, horrible situations because where and whom you follow, where and how you end up is depending on who you follow. Here's what Jesus wants you to know this morning, that as a shepherd, he wants you to follow him. So my prayer is that you would fine-tune your hearing to his voice. You would fine-tune your hearing to his heart. You would fine-tune your hearing as a sheep and trust him every step of the way because there's no point where the sheep follows and says, you know what, shepherd, I've got it from here. Because what you're going to end up, you're going to end up upside down in a craggy ravine with flies infesting your nose, and that's not a pretty picture. Zechariah chapter 10 gives us a picture of a faithful shepherd. And there's three things we see in this passage, and you can read about them later. Number one, the good shepherd rescues. He's a God who says, I'm going to rescue my people. I mean, just look, for example, for, at verse 2. At the very end, it says, therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because why? There's no shepherd. So they've they just chose to do things on their own. They're just selfish, just seeking their own power and prestige. And God steps in and says, I'm going to help them out. I, in verse 6, will strengthen them. He says, I'm going to step in and do something that they can't do for themselves. You know why God is a great shepherd? is because he rescues us. Number one, he strengthens us. Once he rescues us, he sets for us a course where, you know what? He's going to put everything right in your path. If you choose to follow. Everything you need for life and godliness is given to you already. The question is, are you heeding it? Are you obeying it? Are you pursuing it? This is how God strengthens his people. Are you doing what the shepherd's asking you to do? Are you following him? And thirdly, he cares for his people. God does not want you to be destroyed. He cares for you. And then so verse 6 in chapter 10, through the end, verse 12, There's 21 predictive statements of how God cares for his people. You don't want a 21-point outline this morning, do you? I didn't think so. But think about all the ways God says in those verses, I will, I will, I will, I will. Here's a God who doesn't sit passively back and just let his people wander on their own. He's a God who intentionally leads his people, and he says, I'm going to do these things for you. 
I thank God for a faithful shepherd. And when he is faithful, there's nothing but good for his people. And he's always faithful to us. But even when we're faithless, you need to know he doesn't change. His demands may become greater because of our disobedience and our rebellion, but at the heart, he always wants what's best for us. And so the faithful shepherd rescues, he strengthens, he cares for his people. And now, though, we need to consider the rejected shepherd because there's some of Zachariah's audience that doesn't want the shepherd. There's some of you who don't want to follow Jesus and are rejecting him. And I want you to know that there's two reasons why that are pointed out in this passage we reject the good shepherd. Number one, selfishness. And number two, foolishness. So God does something interesting with Zechariah. He basically says, I want you to do some play acting. And I want you to play the role of a shepherd. So he dons the the gear and goes out and shepherds the people. And he wants to demonstrate the faithfulness of the shepherd, number one. That's the act, number one. Now, number two, he's going to act the role of the shepherd that's rejected. And it says in chapter 11, if you skip down to verse 8. No, no, go to verse 7. He says, I pastured the flock, doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. And I took for myself the two staffs. Remember when I told you the two staffs that the shepherd uses? He calls one favor and the other union. And he says, I pastured the flock. Then I annihilated the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them. Their soul was weary of me, meaning they didn't want to be led by this shepherd anymore. So what does God do? Verse 9, then I said, I will not pasture you. What is to die, let it die. And what is to be annihilated, let it be annihilated. And let those who are left eat one another's flesh. Pretty picture, isn't it? Skip to verse 10. So I took my staff favor and cut it in pieces. It is foolishness and it is selfish to try to think you can lead yourself in life. We need God. And if you continue to rebel against his leadership, he takes the staff called favor and breaks it because there is now no more favor being directed to you. Wow, what a haunting scene. And he breaks the, he says, and to break my covenant, which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken, verse 11, on that day. And thus all the afflicted of the flock were watching me realize it was the word of God. He's acting this out. He breaks favor and says, this is what you've done. Because of your disobedience, God's breaking favor with you. Now look at verse 12. And so I said to them, I want you to pay me for my part of playing the rejected shepherd." I want you to pay me for my role in giving you this truth. And this was to point to a future thing, and you're going to see it here. So they pay him his wages. They weighed out 30 shekels of silver as his wages. Does that that, that amount ring a bell with you? 30 pieces of silver? Okay, look at verse 13. And then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. That magnificent price, this is sarcasm, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver, threw it to the potter in the house of the Lord. Does that imagery also sound familiar? Potter? Here's what Zechariah is saying 500 years before Christ would arrive on the scene. Here's the shepherd wanting to lead the people faithfully. They don't want that leadership they'd rather be self-focused they'd rather live in foolishness so they despise the faithful shepherd they reject him and basically by giving 30 shekels of silver which is the price of a slave that's been injured that is no longer useful it wasn't even the full price for a slave it's chump change here you go And Zechariah gets this money, which is of no value, takes it and throws it into the temple at the potter who is there preparing vessels as objects of worship in God's work. Fast forward 500 years to the time of Jesus. You have a character by the name of Judas who arrives on the scene, follows Jesus, and you would think that Judas is a disciple. He's, he's listening, he's participating. 
when Jesus was at the Last Supper, and he said, one of you is going to betray me, not every eye looked at Judas like, he's guilty. I think we think of Judas as the guy walking around like this. He, he didn't look like that. But something in Judas's heart did not want God. Something in Judas's heart said, I am fine on my own. I don't need his lordship. I don't need his, his saving me. I don't need him rescuing me. I got this. And was so selfish and foolish, he denied Jesus at what cost? 30 pieces of silver. Turns Jesus over to the authorities for this amount. Betrays Jesus with a kiss. And then once all those events transpire, realizes the gravity of what he's done, takes the money and goes and he throws it back into the temple. The leadership at that point are like, we've washed our hands of this situation. And they take the money and they go and they buy a potter's field with the 30 pieces of silver which would end up being the burial place for Judas because there's so much shame and guilt and condemnation. He can see no way out other than to take his own life. Zechariah is showing us this picture of what God says not only Judas would do, but anyone who rejects the Savior it leads to nothing but selfishness and foolishness. And there is no great ending for anyone who rejects the good shepherd, Jesus himself. It leads to nothing but despair and discouragement. But here's the thing. If you're not following the faithful shepherd, Jesus, who are you following? See, the world would just, they, they don't want Jesus. They're throwing, you know, just get out of my hair. We, you know, we're, here's what value you are to us. And they throw chump change at Jesus and say, we're good on our own. So the question is, if you're not following Jesus, who are you following? And if you're not following Jesus, I will tell you, anyone you're following does not have your best interests in mind. Jesus comes to give joy. The enemy comes to rob and to steal, steal and destroy. Who are you following? Yourself? Your boss? That positive thinker that's written millions of books? That TV personality? Your Instagram account? Who are you following? Because your sole allegiance to, should be to the good shepherd as he leads you into green pastures and lay you beside still waters to know what he wants for you is what's best for you and he's got his heart for you. If you're not following him, you're rejecting him, but who are you following? There's a story of this tour group in Israel and they're hearing about the shepherd and the sheep imagery. And the tour director's got them on this bus. And they're traveling through the, the hills of, of Galilee. And, and all of a sudden they see this group of sheep wandering up this road. And there's a guy behind the sheep kind of driving them. And one of the people on the tour says, You had told us that the shepherd leads the sheep. And they follow him. They follow his voice. But here we have this sheep and the person's behind them driving them. The tour guide says, oh, that, that's not the shepherd. That's the butcher. And that's exactly the point. If Jesus is not leading you as a shepherd, someone else is driving your life and it's not for your good. And the question is, what will you do about that today? Will you break from anything that doesn't have your best in mind to turn once again to hear the voice of your shepherd who wants to lead you into the ways everlasting? If you're not being led by Jesus, you're only being led to the kill. If you're not being led by Jesus, you're being led to a place of discouragement and despair, and Jesus wants to free you from that. And that's where his kingship 
comes in. To see Jesus as king and shepherd and how these two things are harmonious. Wow! I've given you a lot today. My prayer is this. That you would follow Jesus. First, you know that he himself is salvation. And that once you allow him to take over your life, he is worthy of to follow forever. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, you are good in giving us this time together. You are good in reminding us of such important truth. Lord, forgive us for the ways we have tried to take over our lives. Forgive us for the ways we have neglected in following you. And Lord, Zechariah has served us once again in reminding us that there is nothing good that comes in neglecting your kingship or your shepherding role in our lives. So Father, restore us to that place. Help us to understand what it means to allow you to be Lord and lead. Lord, May you be the only authority in our hearts. And may you be the only voice that we follow. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you peace and grace forever and ever. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Enjoy your cable and lazy boys and barbecue. Love you guys.